Okay, uh, welcome to the first and sign talk of the uh, well, we had one in August, but this is the first regular and sign presentation of the year. So welcome everyone. Um, tonight we have Rob Skinner presenting on presenting a talk called Inside Just a Call Away from No. Uh, I'll let Rob read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, right. I'm going to hand over to Rob. Um, you might see me again at the end. I might talk about what's coming next in its sign. But for now, I'm handing over to Rob, who will tell you about himself and the magic project he's a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to the EdSign Organising Committee for inviting me to present to you this evening. I'm going to be talking about the InSign project. And the subtitle is Just a Call Away from Democracy. So let me tell you about the InSign project. Basically, the project was initiated by the European Commission, who wanted to try and examine how they could increase accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people throughout Europe to European institutions. Previously, the European Union had given a commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of people with disabilities, the UNCRPD. And that UNCRPD came into force in January 2011. Some of you may remember that Colin Allen came and presented an Ed Sign lecture on the CRPD a couple of years ago. And he talked through various articles contained within that convention. And one particular article concentrates on political participation, Article 29, focuses on deaf people's or disabled people's ability to politically participate. So the European Commission wanted to try and increase accessibility to political institutions to enable deaf people, for example, to be able to make phone calls or to make contact with people in <coughs> these political institutions within these European institutions. And there were various options that they considered, and one of these was the InSign project, the funding of the InSign project. To give you a bit more background about the project, you can see here there's a photo of an MEP, member of the European Parliament, Adam Koza. He's a deaf sign language user. He is a member of the European Parliament who was elected as a Hungarian representative. For a while, he was the only deaf MEP, but there are now two deaf MEPs. And it was Adam Koza who actually proposed the need to improve accessibility to the European institutions for deaf and hard of hearing people, to create equity for deaf European citizens and their political participation. And in order to improve this access, Adam Koza proposed an needed investigation. So he asked for the European Commission to establish a video relay service. But at that time, the Commission didn't really understand what that meant. So what they decided to do was establish a, what they called a trial, a proof of concept project, to trial a service and see whether it would be suitable to roll out across Europe. This is a total conversation service. Projects involve various partners. The European Union of the Deaf were the project leaders. A strategy and design company called Design It were involved in the project management. Ives, which is based in France, basically was the total conversation technology provider. They, they developed the software. FC, 
the European Federated Forum of Sign Language Interpreters, and had a lot of experience and expertise in training and provision of interpreters, so they were involved as a partner. Sign Video is a video relay service and video remote interpreting service provider here in the UK. And then we also had a team of researchers from Heriot Watt University involved to provide an evaluation of the project. And I'll talk more about that later. So this is the Heriot Watt University research team. So you have Jemina Napier, who's a principal investigator, Graham Turner. Sorry, I should finger spell their names, Jemina Napier, and Graham Turner, who's the co-investigator. And I worked as the research associate in that team. <coughs> so let me give you some context um, as to why the focus is on video relay services and video remote interpreting services. <coughs> Many of you will be familiar with text relay services. So some people might question why text relay services might not be good enough to contact European institutions <coughs> and so on. But there has been various research conducted on the use of text relay services by deaf and hard of hearing people. And generally this research has found that deaf people are less satisfied <coughs> with text relay services partly because of the time delays involved in writing their text and waiting for the response through a relay operator. And because text relay can only operate at approximately 30 words per minute, whereas if you were conversing in sign language, you could, or spoken language, you could convey your thoughts in approximately 180 words per minute. It's a lot faster. So deaf people have complained, they didn't feel that they could have direct <coughs> interaction with people through text relay services. It's difficult for them to judge the mood of people because of these time delays involved. Research has also shown that hearing call receivers also are not comfortable with text relay <coughs> calls. And they also don't like to make calls to deaf people through text relay services. So it seems that text relay services are appropriate for perhaps deaf people who are comfortable with their own level of English literacy rather than those who prefer to use sign language. But this is a fairly new concept, total conversation. For those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, I'll explain what it means. So basically it means that you can make contact with someone either through audio and speech or through text or through sign language. So you have all three modes of communication within one service, which is why it's called total conversation. And total conversation is a term that was created by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which is kind of the international equivalent of <coughs> which is the UK equivalent. So total conversation would appear to be a very appropriate service for deaf and hard of hearing people to gain access to European institutions because they would have a choice of which language mode to use. So a part of total conversation would include video relay services. So you can see a deaf person would be able to make a call in sign language and this would be relayed by a sign language interpreter who would then reproduce the message in spoken English, for example, to a hearing call receiver. So this is referred to as video relay service because it's across three different locations. The deaf person, the interpreter, and the hearing person are all in different locations. In comparison, video remote interpreting is slightly different. So that tends to occur across two locations. So for example, you might have a deaf person and a hearing person situated together, 
but because they can't communicate directly, they then make a call to a, a remote interpreter based in a different location and communicate via that interpreter through a video interface. This is a newer aspect of Total Conversation, which is a remote captioning service. So it's a little bit like VRS, the video relay service example that I've already shown you. So again, it's across three locations. But in this instance, the deaf person might want to use their own voice. They actually might want to speak for themselves. But in talking to a hearing person, they can't hear their response. So what happens is, is the relay operator in the middle would relay into what the hearing person says back so the deaf person can read it. And this person is actually called a read speaker. So rather than typing the text at 30 words per minute, <coughs> they use a special software to re-speak what the hearing person has just said. And because they're using the special software, the computer recognizes their voice and automatically generates the written text from the spoken words. So it means that the read speaker can slow down the pace of the speech in order to generate written text for the deaf person to read that. And a read speaker can actually produce approximately 100 to 120 words per minute. Can I just check if anyone has any questions about any of these models so far? So with a remote captioning service, when the deaf person is making the call, they're using what's called voice carryover through to the hearing person. And in a, in a similar way with video relay services, it's also possible within a total conversation platform for a deaf person to use their own voice to speak for themselves, but then a sign language interpreter relays back what the hearing person has said into sign language for the deaf person to watch. So if you imagine that you're a deaf person, you're at home, you want to make contact with your MEP or another member of a European institution, you could log on to the InSign website, and this is the first screen that you would see. So you would be given the choice whether to speak for yourself or whether you want to sign. So you'd be given the choice of how to communicate. You would then be able to choose which sign language you would prefer to use. In this initial pilot, there were only six languages offered. <coughs> Because it was only a pilot, we were only able to offer six languages, but hopefully in the future, if the project and the service is rolled out, it's possible that all sign languages within the EU would be offered as part of the service. So let's imagine I'm a deaf BSL user. I would select a BSL interpreter, and this is what I would see on the screen. And it's useful here to have the keyboard as well. So even if you're presenting in sign language, you might be able to type the name of a person or a phone number to call, and that can actually give you an extra layer of text for the communication purpose. As part of the project, we it was ascertained that it, would, it was necessary to, to conduct a survey to determine the needs and experiences of deaf and hard of hearing people about their experiences of using services such as VRS and VRI services. So this is an example of the survey that we used. You can see a picture of me. The survey was conducted in international sign and also with plain English. And we provided icons for people to select in order to make their responses. 
In total, there are approximately 50 questions <coughs> as part of the survey. And that survey was administered to deaf and hard of hearing people. But we also conducted another survey with interpreters who have experience of working with BRS and BRI. We wanted to examine their experiences, any problems they'd encountered, any challenges they wanted to share, which would also help us as part of this research process. The third stage of research was to ask questions of re-speakers and their experiences, but we actually found that most re-speakers only had experience of working for television captioning purposes rather than within relay services. So it was difficult for us to ask them their experiences. So although re-speaking is now available in the UK for relay services, that took place after the survey was conducted. <coughs> so in summary, the majority of the deaf respondents were those people that prefer to use sign language. So it meant, as a consequence, they all, I would say most of them, preferred to use video interpreting services rather than text-based services because of the fact that they prefer to use sign language. Approximately half of the respondents said that they do not have access to the service of their preferred choice currently in their home country. And even though some of them were sign languages, they still said they preferred to use text relay services. So we did some follow-up interviews with people who had responded to the service, to the survey, and asked them why sometimes they preferred to use text relay services. And what they told us was that when they're participating in a video interpreting service, they felt it wasn't as confidential because having to make eye contact literally with an interpreter who relayed their message, they felt that the, the interpreter could see them, they weren't sure they could trust them, whereas with a text relay operator, they're less likely to know that person, that person is less likely to know them, and they felt that they had no privacy that mm -hmm. So it kind of made me think about having to have some kind of ninja interpreter disguising their face in the future <laughs> to participate in video interpreting calls. <laughs> We asked uh, deaf and hard of hearing <coughs> survey respondents why they dominantly would use video relay services or video interrupting services. And most of them do use it either for work, to make appointments with their doctor, or to make a call to their bank. And these are the most popular reasons that relay services are currently used. There were some negative concerns expressed by the survey respondents in relation to video interpreting. The first concern was in relation to technical reliability. The second concern was in relation to interpreting quality and that they weren't always confident in the quality of the interpreting service they received. Others reported concerns around professionalism of interpreters and safeguarding of their privacy. And some people commented on the lack of choice of interpreters available to them because when asked, they said they would normally prefer to be able to choose which interpreter to have, but with a video relay service, often that, that choice is not available to them. And predominantly, all of these deaf people said that they would prefer to have an on-site, face-to-face interpreter over and above video interpreting at every opportunity. We also asked in the survey what respondents would think of an in-sign service. Do they think it would be worthwhile? Would they like to see something like this rolled out? And many of the respondents did say that they thought it would be good to have the opportunity to contact the MEP by telephone. But, in contrast to that, they felt it was kind of ironic if a service was established at the European level where there were not yet services in existence in their own countries. 
So if you remember, for example, here in Scotland, Contact Stop Scotland service hadn't been established yet. When we first conducted this survey, because it was over a year ago, this service didn't exist. So it was important for deaf people, as far as they were concerned, to see services in their own countries first before seeing it at the European level. Now I'll move on to talking about the summary of interpreting responses. Most of the interpreters responded by saying that they felt that video interpreting services are a very positive thing for deaf and highly hearing people because it can benefit, benefit them in their everyday lives and they can have access to this kind of service. But they also had concerns as did the deaf and hard of hearing people in relation to the technical, technical reliability of these services. When I asked in terms of how they felt working in these services would benefit them, they felt that they had no personal benefit. It was more of a benefit for deaf people. They did recognize that there were benefits in terms of working conditions, like not having to travel to work, but they could be based in the same place. But there were not any other particular benefits. And they felt that it was actually more important to increase the supply of interpreters to deaf people so they could make as many calls as they wanted to in one day. When we asked the interpreters about challenges that they encountered, in working for the VRS services, they said it was the fact that they had to make so many calls with so many different people, and often these people were from different locations, had a lot of sign language variation, so it meant that their coping strategies were um, more highly needed, there was a lot more demand on them. They also noted that not all deaf people understood how to best use interpreters through a video relay service. So sometimes the interpreter had to take on that load to try and manage the communication and educate both callers, the deaf and the human people, in how this call could most effectively happen. So after the preliminary surveys, we produced a report for the European Commission about what we had found and the fact that InSign generally would be regarded as a popular option. Then the next part of the project was to actually trial the service itself. So this was back in April 2014, and it coincided with the elections in the European Parliament. And the European Union of the Deaf had been lobbying parliamentary members for MEPs or other representatives to use the inside service to encourage their deaf constituents to contact them through this service and to participate in this peaceful process, in the election process. So we had different sites involved in this trial, which we monitored. So there were interpreters based in London, who came from Spain, from France, from Belgium, and also British interpreters, and they were all based in one call centre in London. And in the room, in the European Parliament, they were enabled to make calls via the call centre to MEPs in their offices in the parliamentary buildings. So this, this took place, this trial took place over one day. And then approximately 36 calls were made during the trial and that went through the call centre in London. The average time of a call was about six minutes, just over six minutes. And there were some technical issues experienced during the trial. And also the interpreters experienced issues in how to convey the call, how to manage the call between an MEP and their expectations, what they would expect in receiving a call, and also deaf callers' expectations. 
But we were fortunate because it was a trial and it's part of a research project, we were able to conduct a focus group immediately with the interpreters who were all based in the same place to talk to them about their experience and then we could document their comments on their experience, which we then incorporated into training for interpreters at a later stage of the project. The second trial of the service took place at the annual general meeting, general assembly of the EUD, European Union of the Deaf in Athens. And at this meeting, there were key representatives from various deaf associations from across Europe, and they were given the opportunity to try to download the software, the inside software, onto their own devices, whether it's a phone, uh, either an Android or an iPhone, or another device like a laptop or an iPad, another tablet. And so these people were given the opportunity to download the service and make a call, download the app and then make a call. And again, we found that there were some glitches, there were some slight issues experience, but generally it was fairly smooth and most people managed to download just the necessary software and make a call through the time service. And when we asked these deaf people who were present at the General Assembly if they would like to see an inside service established, they all agreed that they felt it would be valuable for them so that they could have direct access to European institutions that could lobby their members of the European Parliament and so on. The final trial took place in September 2014 at the European Commission. And if you remember, it was the European Commission that funded the project. So basically, we were doing a demonstration for them of the service and of the technology. So the representatives of the European Commission themselves could see the various components of the total conversation service. They could see the BRS, the BRI, and the re-speaking service. Now, the final trial was slightly different from the first one that was based in London because in the final trial, each of the interpreters was actually based in their home country, so they weren't all in the same location. So all the calls were being rerouted through to wherever the interpreters were based. The research team at Heriot Watts were examining various aspects as part of the ethnographic research. So we observed interpreters and re-speakers, how they managed the calls, how they functioned. We also interviewed deaf and hard of hearing people about their experience, their thoughts, their comments about the service and the platform. We also conducted focus group discussions with the interpreters, which as I said earlier, provide very valuable information for us to use later on in a training component that we provide as part of the project. And one of the most fortunate things about this project was that we were able to actually record the data from the video calls that were made. So as a researcher, it was a rich opportunity for us to actually analyze exactly what happened during these calls because we had the authentic data there, we had the evidence. We've actually used pseudonyms here, so this is not the real name of this person, but this is an example of a comment from a deaf caller who was involved in the trial. And this caller felt that they could communicate using the InSign service and thought that because there wasn't the te technological capacity for deaf people to access to European institutions. There was, that's why there's a lack of political participation, but with a service such as InSign, he felt that it would be possible for deaf people to become more involved and would like to see the promotion of political participation through a service such as this. We we're also interested to ask the hearing callers, because often research tends to focus on the deaf people's experiences. So, we asked some of the hearing call receivers what they had experienced during the trials. This is one example from one caller, Susie, who said, well, for me it ran smoothly, I felt there was no delay, it was very quick. 
I know that I'll, what I was saying was being translated to text, but while I couldn't see the captions, I heard from the experts. So overall, the deaf participants generally welcomed the, the idea of the InSign project, and they wanted to see the same kind of service replicated by their national governments within their own respective countries. And the dev participants did comment on the reliability of the technology and felt that it was an issue that needed to be resolved. And we also noted that it's, the technological issues were not necessarily always to do with the service itself. Sometimes it's the venue you're in, the Wi-Fi, the broadband accessibility that you have. People in their home area perhaps might have a weaker internet connection because there are too many users around. So there are various factors that have to be considered when considering what the technological issues are. We also noted that there were some conflicts that arose in telephone culture. So basically, in following telephone etiquette and how you would expect to carry out a conversation through a telephone when it has to happen through an intellectual tour we speak. So deaf and hearing people had something to learn about each other's telephone cultures, if you like. And hearing participants told us that they wanted to be able to actually see who they were talking to. It was interesting, they commented that the deaf people and the interpreters could see each other, but the hearing call receivers couldn't see any of the other participants. And they felt that it would have been helpful to them if there'd been a three-way video link so that each of them could all see each other. And it might have been easier actually to manage the communication if that being the case. Overall, we noted that the interpreters cope very well. They confidently applied strategies to overcome technical difficulties. They problem solved on the spot. They often gave feedback or advice to callers and would, or would explain what was happening if there were technological problems. And they also seemed to be confident in handling the cool variety that they received from the various people that called them. It was interesting to note, however, that the interpreters did vary in how they introduced the calls. <laughs> so some interpreters, for example, let the deaf person take the lead and introduce themselves and explain how the interpreting service was going to occur. And sorry, baby's crying. And other interpreters introduced themselves and they led on um, explaining how the call would take place. Some interpreters provided assistance to facilitate the flow of the conversation and did not function just in a conduit model, so they actually participated in the conversation to make sure it flowed smoothly. So these are our recommendations that we made at the end of the project. And I'll just go through these quickly. We suggested that we should ensure that there are clear policies that promote a safe working environment and that would encourage this co-constructive interaction. So it would make it a much safer and more pleasant, comfortable, working space for interpreters. But it's also important to remember that training needs to be aligned with these policies to promote good practice. Highly skilled interpreters are needed to manage a variety of different calls. And we also felt that it's worth establishing online video tutorials, for example, to raise awareness among users about how to work with this total conversation service, what 
the service means, how it's provided and so on. Because for example, a hearing person might be confused by the fact that a deaf person is calling them but is using their own voice. So if they had access to video tutorials, they would have a better understanding of the protocols involved. One of the things that occurred to us during this project was the fact that hearing people, in making contact with their MEP or their MP, would typically make contact initially by email and then might organise to have a follow-up phone call. So one of the proposals that we put forward as part of this project was that deaf people might also want to be able to access an email translation service so they could produce commentary in sign language, it could be translated into an email sent to the MP, and a return email could be then retranslated back into sign language, and this deaf person can have a dialogue by email, and then arrange to have a follow-up phone call by the sign service. So a translation service could also be offered. And we also suggested that a three-way video link option could be offered, as I mentioned earlier. So in conclusion, it was felt that a pan-European service such as InSign could contribute and improve access for deaf people across Europe. They would have a willingness to engage in democracy in political participation through this kind of telecommunication service. But the success of this kind of service still heavily relies on the quality of the interpreters that are provided. So we would need to ensure that interpreters within any part of this political process should be fully trained and assessed for competence. They would need to be regulated by competent authority <coughs> and to adhere to a code of ethics. Because as we know, the deaf participants in our study commented on their concerns in relation to confidentiality. And that's it, thank you very much. Over to you for questions. Thanks very much, Rob. That was wonderful. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Can you go back to the early slide? So the a hearing person uh, is calling, but the deaf person has an option to use either speech or sign language. So if the deaf person doesn't want to, to use sign language, they can they have an option to use speech. Yes, not that slide. Yeah, so basically they have all the options. So these are just different examples that I've presented. So they can either speak for themselves or they can use video. And if they're making a video call. then it's possible to call the hearing person who speaks and then it's relayed back through a sign language interpreter. So, so imagine you, Leia, you want to make a call. Well, I am the friendly, so I, know. I don't have to pretend. But imagine that you want to make a call and you want to talk to me as a hearing person, say imagine that I'm an MEP. So you would make a call to the <coughs> sign language interpreter. If you wanted to, you could choose to speak. And so, as the MEP, I would hear your voice, or you could sign, and the interpreter would interpret you into English. Okay, but also in, in the response, when they respond, is there an option there? Because maybe I don't want to see the sign language. Can I can I read the text instead? Can I read the text version? So yes, you can actually. 
I want to use my voice. So maybe maybe a deaf person has good speech and they want to use their, their voice. Okay. And then so to speak. And then when the MEP or who the hearing person responds, I would like to be able to see, I'd like to be able to hear the text <coughs> Is that possible? Yes, through the remote captioning service. That would mean that you would speak, and then there's the relay operator, or operator which is called a re speaker. They don't need to do anything. When you're speaking, that goes directly through to the MEP who can hear you. When the MEP responds, then the re speaker re speaks what I've just said, and that re spoken. Those re spoken words are then converted into written text for you to read. And so, by doing, engaging in that process, it's quicker than someone typing the response. So, it's almost like a live copy. Yeah. So, you know, like how you watch captions at home on television? It's the same idea. So, the re speaking occurs with television captioning as well. So what they do is they re-speak what people in the TV program are saying, it's converted into text, but this is the same model, but just in a relay So you could use either, whatever's easier for you, whether it's sign language or, or speech or whatever, whatever suits you. 